Hi, boys and girls. Miss Kathy here from Shaler North Hills Library, and we are reading another installment of our Magic Treehouse series. And today, in honor of Christmas week coming up very soon, this is the last of these programs, at least for a little while, then we're going to take a Christmas break. I'm choosing to do Christmas in Camelot, which is the first of the Merlin missions. So this one's gonna be a little bit longer, but very exciting. So let's see what Christmas in Camelot is all about. Prologue. Once upon a time in Frog Creek, Pennsylvania, a mysterious tree house appeared in the woods. A boy named Jack and his sister Annie climbed into the treehouse. They found that it was filled with books. Jack and Annie soon discovered that the treehouse was magic. It could take them to the places they read about in the books. All they had to do was point to a picture and wish to go there. They discovered that during their adventures, no time at all passed in Frog Creek. Jack and Annie eventually learned that the treehouse belonged to Morgan Le Fay, an enchantress from Camelot, the long-ago kingdom of King Arthur. On one of their journeys, Jack and Annie visited Morgan's library in Camelot and brought hope and courage to King Arthur. Now it is winter. Jack and Annie have not seen Morgan or the magic treehouse for many months. A big spell without her. Chapter 1, A Royal Invitation Sunlight had faded from the late afternoon sky. Puffy snow clouds were moving in. Let's hurry, I'm cold, said Jack. He and Annie were walking home from school. Their Christmas vacation was just beginning. Coo-coo! Wait, said Annie, look. She pointed to a white bird sitting on a bare tree branch at the end of the woods. The bird was staring straight at them. It's a dove, said Jack. It's a messenger, said Annie, from Morgan. No, Jack said, afraid to get his hopes up. They hadn't seen Morgan Le Fay in a long time. He really missed her. Yes, said Annie. She has a mission for us. I can feel it. In the hush of the cold twilight, the dove spread its wings and flew into the Frog Creek woods. Come on, said Annie. The tree house is back. You're just hoping, said Jack. I'm knowing, said Annie. She ran into the woods following the white dove. Oh, brother, said Jack, but he took off after Annie. Even in the growing darkness, they easily found their way. They zigzagged between the bare trees and ran over the frozen ground until they came to the tallest oak in the woods. See, said Annie, pointing to the top of the tree. Yeah, whispered Jack. There it was, the magic tree house. Morgan, shouted Annie. Jack held his breath, waiting to see the enchantress at the tree house window, but Morgan did not appear. Annie grabbed the rope ladder and started up. Jack followed. When they climbed inside the treehouse, Jack saw something lying on the floor. It was a scroll rolled up and tied with a red velvet ribbon. Jack picked up the scroll and unrolled it. A thick yellowed paper shimmered with large gold writing. Wow, Morgan sent us a really fancy note, said Annie. It's an invitation, said Jack. Listen. Dear Jack and Annie, please accept the royal invitation to spend Christmas in the kingdom of Camelot. M. Christmas in Camelot, said Annie. I don't believe it. Cool, whispered Jack. He pictured a beautiful glowing castle lit with candles and filled with knights and ladies and feasting and singing. We're going to celebrate Christmas with Morgan and King Arthur, said Annie, and Queen Guinevere. Yeah, said Jack, and the knights of the round table like Sir Lancelot. Let's go, said Annie. Where's the book? She and Jack looked around the treehouse for a book about Camelot. The only book they saw was the Pennsylvania book that always brought them home. That's strange, said Jack. Morgan didn't send a book about Camelot with the royal invitation. How does she expect us to get there? I don't know, said Annie. Maybe she forgot. Jack picked up the invitation. He read it again. He turned it over, hoping to find more information. The back of the scroll was blank. He handed the invitation to Annie. She must have forgotten, he said. Darn, said Annie, staring at the gold writing. I really wish we could go to Camelot. The tree branches rustled. The wind began to blow. What's happening, said Jack. I don't know, said Annie. Wait a minute, said Jack. You are holding the invitation, and you made a wish 
The wind blew harder. That must have made the magic work, cried Annie. Jack felt a surge of joy. We're going to Camelot, he said. The treehouse started to spin. It spun faster and faster. So then everything was still. Absolutely still. Chapter 2. This is Camelot? Jack shivered. He could see his breath in the dim light. Annie was staring out the window. This is Camelot, she said. Jack looked out with her. The treehouse had landed in a grove of tall, bare trees. A huge, dark castle loomed against the gray sky. No light shone from the windows. No banners waved from its turrets. Wind whistled through its tall towers, sounding sad and lonely. It looks deserted, said Annie. Yes, yeah, said Jack. I hope we came to the right place. Jack pulled his notebook and pencil out of his pack. He wanted to write a description of the dark castle. Hey, I see someone, said Annie. Jack looked out the window again. A woman was crossing the castle drawbridge. She wore a long cloak and carried a lantern. Her white hair blew in the wind. Morgan, said Annie and Jack together. They laughed with relief. Morgan hurried over the frost-covered ground toward the grove of trees. Annie, Jack, is that you? She called. Of course, who'd you think? Shouted Annie. She started down from the treehouse. Jack threw his notebook into his backpack. He followed Annie down the rope ladder. When they reached the icy ground, they ran to Morgan and both threw their arms around her. I was looking out a window in the castle and saw a bright flash in the orchard, said Morgan. What are you doing here? You didn't send the treehouse for us, asked Jack. With a royal invitation to spend Christmas in Camelot, asked Annie. No, said Morgan. She sounded alarmed. But the invitation was signed with an M, said Jack. I don't understand, said Morgan. We are not celebrating Christmas in Camelot this year. You aren't, said Jack. Why not, said Annie. A look of sadness crossed Morgan's face. Do you remember when you visited my library and gave King Arthur the hope and courage to challenge his enemy? She asked. Sure, said Jack. Well, Arthur's enemy was a man named Mordred, said Morgan. After you left, Arthur defeated him, but not before Mordred's dark wizard cast a spell over the whole kingdom. The spell robbed Camelot of all its joy. What? All its joy? whispered Annie. Yes, said Morgan. For months, Camelot has been without music, without celebration, and without laughter. Oh, no, said Annie. What can we do to help, said Jack. Morgan smiled sadly. This time I don't think you can do anything, she said. But perhaps it will lift Arthur's spirits to see you both again. Come, let us go inside the castle. Morgan held up her lantern and started toward the drawbridge. Jack and Annie hurried after her. As they walked through the outer courtyard, the frozen grass cracked under their sneakers. They followed Morgan over the bridge and through a tall gate. There were no signs of life in the castle's inner courtyard. Where is everyone? Annie whispered to Jack. I don't know, he whispered back. Jack really wished they had a book about Camelot. It might help them understand what was going on. Morgan led them to a huge archway with two wooden doors. She stopped and looked at them. I'm afraid no book would help you tonight, Jack, she said. Jack was startled that Morgan had read his thoughts. Why not? asked Annie. On all your journeys, you visited real places and times in history, said Morgan. Camelot is different. How? said Jack. The story of Camelot is a legend, said Morgan. A legend is a story that begins in truth, but then imagination takes over. Different people in different times tell the story. They use their imagination to add new parts. That is how a legend is kept alive. Tonight we'll add our part, said Annie. Yes, said Morgan, and please, I beg you, in the lantern light she looked very serious, do not let the story of Camelot end forever. Keep our kingdom alive. Of course we will, said Annie. Good, said Morgan. Come then, let us go into the great hall and see the king. Morgan lifted an iron latch and pushed open the heavy doors. Jack and Annie followed her into the dark castle. Chapter 3, The Knights of the Round Table. A pair of torches dimly lit the drafty entrance hall of the castle. Shadows danced on the warm tapestries. Wait here, said Morgan. I will tell the king of your arrival. She headed through the huge stone archway that led to the great hall. Let's peek in, Annie said to Jack. 
Jack pushed his glasses into place. He and Annie walked quietly over to the big arch and peered in. The ceiling of the great hall towered high above a stone floor. At the far end of the room, King Arthur and his knights were sitting around a huge round table. They all wore brown tunics. They had shaggy hair and beards. Their names were carved in gold letters on the back of the chairs. The Knights of the Round Table, whispered Jack. Morgan was talking to King Arthur. Beside the king sat a woman in plague, plain, plain gray robe. She had pale skin and brown curly hair. Queen Guinevere, whispered Annie. Morgan left the king and Jack and Annie moved quickly back into the shadows. A moment later, Morgan appeared. I told the king that two special friends of his have just arrived. She said, come with me. As they walked with Morgan through the great hall, Jack shivered. The huge room was draft and damp. There was no fire in the fireplace. The stone floor was so cold that Jack could feel the chill through his sneakers. They stopped near the round table. King Arthur stared at them with his piercing gray eyes. Greetings from Frog Creek, Annie said to the king and queen. Annie bowed and Jack bowed too. The queen smiled, but King Arthur did not. Your majesty, you remember Jack and Annie, said Morgan. You met them last summer in my library. Indeed, I shall never forget them, King Arthur said softly. Greetings, Annie. Greetings, Jack. How do you come to be in Camelot on this bleak night? We came in the magic tree house, said Annie. A shadow crossed the king's face. He looked at Morgan. No, your majesty, I did not use my magic to bring them here, she said. Perhaps a bit of magic still lingers in the tree house and it traveled on its own. What's going on, Jack wondered. Why does King Arthur seem unhappy about the magic tree house? King Arthur looked back at Jack and Annie. However you have come, you are welcome in my kingdom, he said. He turned to the Queen Guinevere. These are the two friends who once gave me hope and courage in a time of need. Queen Guinevere smiled again, but there was a sad look in her eyes. I have heard much about you, she said. I've heard about you too, said Annie. Allow me to present my knights, said King Arthur. Sir Bors, Sir Kay, Sir Tristram, as the king named each knight, Jack and Annie nodded shyly. The knights nodded at them in return. Jack waited to hear the name Sir Lancelot, but the most famous, uh, the most famous of Camelot's knights, but the king never said it. And finally, Sir Bedivere and Sir Gawain, King Arthur said. The king then turned to three empty chairs at the table. And there once sat three who are lost to us now, he said. Lost how? wondered Jack. You may sit at their places and join our dinner, King Arthur said. Thank you, said Annie. Following Morgan around the table, Jack read the names carved on the backs of the three empty chairs, Sir Lancelot, Sir Galahad, Sir Percival. Jack took off his backpack and sat down in Sir Lancelot's place. As he sat tall and straight in the heavy wooden chair, Jack looked at the king and his knights. They were gnawing meat off bones and slurping wine from heavy goblets. They ain't without manners or delight. Jack really wanted to take notes. He reached into his pack under the table and pulled out his notebook and pencil. But before he could write a word, a serving boy brought more food. Jack quickly put his things away. The boy set a greasy slab of beef on a soggy piece of bread in front of him. The food looked terrible. Not much of a Christmas feast, huh? Annie said in a low voice. Jack shook his head. Annie leaned close to Morgan and whispered so King Arthur wouldn't hear. What happened to the three lost knights? she asked. After Morgred's dark wizard cast his spell, the king sought help from the magicians of Camelot, Morgan said quietly. They told him he must send his knights on a quest to the other world to recapture our kingdom's joy. What's the other world? said Jack. It is an ancient enchanted land beyond the edge of the earth, said Morgan, the place where all magic first began. Wow, whispered Annie. The king chose his three bravest knights to journey there, said Morgan. When they did not come back, Arthur turned against his magicians. He blamed magic for all of Camelot's woes. Hence, he has banned magic of any kind from the kingdom forever. But you're a magician, whispered Annie. Did the king turn against you, too? Arthur and I have a long friendship, said Morgan. He has allowed me to stay in the castle as long as I promise not to practice the art of magic ever again. 
A feeling of dread crept over Jack. So does that mean the magic tree house is? Morgan nodded. Yes, banished from Camelot, she said. I'm afraid this will be your last journey and the last time we see each other. Her eyes filled with tears. She looked away. What? The last time we see each other forever, said Annie. Before Morgan could answer, the wooden doors swung open with a bang. A wind rushed through the great hall. The torches and candles flamed brighter, making the shadows leap wildly on the walls. The sound of hoofbeats filled the room. A knight on a huge horse rode through the arched doorway. The knight was dressed all in red from his shining helmet to the long cloak on his back. His horse was dressed all in green from the armor that covered his head to the cloth that hung from his saddle. Oh, wow, breathed Danny, a Christmas night. Chapter four, who will go? I've come to see Arthur the King, the Christmas knight said. His deep voice echoed from inside his helmet. His red armor gleamed in the firelight. King Arthur stood up. He stared fiercely at the knight, but he spoke in a calm, steady voice. I am Arthur the King, he said. Who are you? The knight did not answer Arthur's question. So you are the legendary King Arthur of Camelot, he said in a mocking voice, and these must be the famous knights of the round table. Yes, said King Arthur, and again I ask, who are you? The Christmas knight still did not answer Arthur's question. The spell of the dark wizard has robbed Camelot of its joy, said the Christmas knight. Has it robbed you and your men of your courage as well? You dare to question our courage, King Arthur said in a low, angry voice. Camelot is dying, the Christmas knight boomed. Why has no one journeyed to the other world to recapture its joy? I have sent my best knights on such a quest, said King Arthur. They never returned. Then send more, thundered the Christmas knight. No, shouted King Arthur, pounding his fists on the table. Never again will I feed good men to the magic and want monsters of the other world. Jack felt a chill of fear. What monsters? Then you choose your fate, said the Christmas knight. If you will send no one else to the other world, all that your kingdom has gained through time, all beauty, music, wonder, and light, all that Camelot has ever been or could ever be, will be lost and forgotten forever. No, shouted Annie. Shh, Annie, said Jack. The Christmas knight turned to the knights at the table. Who will go, he boomed. We will, shouted Annie. We will, said Jack. Yes, we'll go on the quest, Annie yelled. She jumped up. No, cried Morgan Le Fay. Never, said King Arthur. Annie, said Jack. He leaped up from his chair and tried to grab her. Yes, thundered the Christmas knight. He pointed his red-gloved hand at Annie and Jack, the youngest of all. These two, they will go. You are mocking us, King Arthur shouted. They will go, boomed the knight. His words echoed throughout the hall. Oh, no, thought Jack. Yes, said Annie. She pulled Jack toward the Christmas knight. King Arthur turned to his men. Stop them! Several knights started to rush toward Jack and Annie. The Christmas knight raised his gloved hand high in the air. In an instant, the room fell deathly quiet. Everyone around the table was as still as a statue. King Arthur looked like the statue of a furious king. Queen Guinevere looked like the statue of a worried queen. The knights of the round table looked like statues of fierce knights. And Morgan Le Fay looked like the statue of a caring friend. Her mouth was open as if she were calling out to Jack and Annie, but no sound came from her lips. No sound at all. Chapter 5, Rhymes of the Christmas Night. Morgan, said Annie. Annie ran to the table. She touched Morgan's cheek, then quickly pulled her hand back. She's cold. She's cold as ice, said Annie. Tears filled her eyes. Annie turned to the Christmas night in a fury. What did you do to Morgan, she asked. Bring her back. Do not fear, said the Christmas night. His voice was softer and kinder. She will come back to life after you complete your quest. Well, what exactly is our quest, said Jack. You must journey to the underworld, other world, said the Christmas night. There you will find a cauldron. The cauldron is filled with the water of memory and imagination. You must bring a cup of the water back to Camelot. If you fail, Camelot will never come back to life. Never. How do we do all that? asked Annie, wiping her eyes. 
Remember these three rhymes, said the Christmas knight. Wait, let me write them down, said Jack. His hands trembled as he pulled out his notebook and pencil. He looked at the Christmas knight. Okay, I'm ready, he said. Gripping his pencil made Jack feel stronger. The knight's voice rang out from inside his helmet. Be iron, beyond the iron gate, the keepers of the cauldron wait. Jack quickly wrote down the knight's words. Okay, what's next, he said. The Christmas knight went on. Four gifts you will need. The first from me, then a cup, a compass, and finally, a key. Cup, compass, key, got it, said Jack. The Christmas knight's voice boomed again. If you survive to complete your quest, the secret door lies to the west. Jackie copied down the last rhyme, then looked up at the knight. Anything else, he asked. Without a word, the knight pulled off his red cloak. He dropped it on the floor. It fell silently into a heap at Jack and Annie's feet. The Christmas night snapped his horse's red reins, then galloped out of the great hall. Chapter 6, A White Comet Once the night was gone, the candles and torches in the great hall grew dimmer. A brighter, bitter chill crept over the room. What do these three minds mean, said Jack, looking at his notebook. Who are the keepers of the cauldron? What secret door? I don't know, said Annie. I just know we have to save Morgan. She gathered the red cloak up in her arms. We've got our first gift, she said. Let's go. Wait, we should figure this out first, said Jack. No, we should just go, said Annie. She turned and headed for the archway. Jack pushed his glasses into place and looked back at the round table, at the frozen king and queen, at the frozen knights, and at Morgan Le Fay. He loved Morgan. She was their great friend and teacher. If he and Annie did not go on their quest, Morgan's story and the stories of Camelot and all the stories about the magic treehouse would end forever. Jack took a deep breath. He put his notebook into his backpack. Then he turned toward the archway. Annie, he said. She was gone. Annie, wait, he shouted. Wait. Jack ran out of the great hall. Annie, I'm here, she said quietly. I'm waiting. She was standing at the end of the entrance hall, peering outside. How do we get to the other world, she asked. Maybe the treehouse can take us there, said Jack. Come on. Together, Jack and Annie hurried through the inner courtyard of the castle and over the drawbridge. They ran over the frozen ground to the moonlit grove of trees. Clutching the red cloak, Annie started up the rope ladder. Jack followed. They climbed inside the treehouse and sat on the floor. Annie picked up the royal invitation. Close your eyes. I'll make the wish, she said. Jack closed his eyes. He was shivering from the cold. I wish we could go to the other world, said Annie. The bare branches of the trees rattled in the wind. I think it's working, whispered Annie. The wind stopped howling. Jack opened his eyes. He and Annie looked out the window. The dark castle loomed against the sky. They were still in Camelot. It, it didn't work, said Jack, his teeth chattering. Yes, it did, whispered Annie. Look down. Standing below the treehouse was the biggest deer Jack had ever seen. The deer was staring up at them with amber eyes. His huge antlers seemed to glow in the cold moonlight. Most amazing of all, the deer was completely white, as white as new fallen snow. A white stag, said Jack. Puffs of frosty air blew from the stag's nostrils. He stepped toward the treehouse and shook his head, giant head. He's come to take us on our journey, said Annie. People don't ride deer, said Jack. But Annie had already started down the rope ladder. Jack watched from the window as she walked to the stag and spoke softly. The stag knelt. Annie climbed on his back. Come on, she called to Jack. Bring the cloak. Okay, okay, said Jack. He gathered up the heavy velvet cloak. Clutching it against his chest, he climbed down the rope ladder. He hurried over to Annie and the white stag. Put on the cloak and climb up behind me, said Annie. Jack put the cloak on over his backpack. He pulled it around his shoulders and buttoned it at the neck. As the cloak fell down around his body, the soft, smooth cloth made him feel warm and safe. Ready, said Annie. Yeah, said Jack. He climbed onto the sag, stag's back behind Annie. The white stag slowly stood up. Annie leaned forward, putting her arms around its neck. Jack leaned forward, too, and held on to Annie. The red velvet cloak draped over both of them, falling past their feet. 
The white stag stepped gracefully over the frozen grass. He walked through the outer gate of the castle. He blew out a puff of air, then broke into a leaping run. Jack held on tightly to Annie as the stag dashed across a frost-covered field. He jumped over hedgerows and stone walls. He bounded across icy streams. Annie's braids floated on the wind. The red cloak billowed behind them. Jack was amazed at how easy it was to ride on the stag's back. He felt calm and safe as the stag sped like a white comet through the wintry countryside. The stag ran past flocks of sheep and herds of goats asleep in the meadows. He ran past thatched huts and quiet stables. The stag ran on and on through the starry night. Jack saw a cloud-covered mountain range in the distance. When they came close to the craggy mountains, Jack was sure the stag would stop, but he galloped on, not even breaking his stride as he started up a rocky slope. The stag finally came to a halt on the ledge of a steep cliff. In a windy swirl of fog and cloud, he knelt to the ground, and Jack and Annie slid off his back. The stag stood up. He stared down at them with his glowing amber eyes. Thank you, said Annie. Do you have to leave now? The stag lowered his head and raised it again. He blew out a frosty puff of air, then leapt away, vanishing into the mist. Bye, Annie said wistfully. She stared back the, at, into the mist for a moment, then turned to Jack. What do we do now? I don't know, said Jack. Let's read the three rhymes again. He reached under the red cloak and pulled off his pack. He took out his notebook and started to read the first rhyme. Beyond the Iron Gate. Jack, interrupted Annie. Look. Jack looked up. The wind had blown away some of the fog. Beyond the cliff rose another mountain. A huge gate was built into its side. A pale light shone between the gate's thick iron bars. Two knights in gold armor stood guard under flaming torches. Oh, man, whispered Jack. That's it, the Iron Gate, said Annie. If we pass through that gate, we'll be in the other world. Chapter 7, A Good Trick As the wind blew away more fog, Jack and Annie saw a bridge. It was made of thick wooden planks held together with iron bands. It stretched all the way from the edge of the cliff where they were standing to the Iron Gate. Come on, let's go, said Annie. Wait, said Jack. What about the guards? Two guards in gold armor stood perfectly still. Their huge spears gleamed in the torchlight. I don't know, said Annie. Read the second rhyme. Jack looked in his notebook and read aloud, Four gifts you will need. The first from me, then a cup, a compass, and finally, a key. The first gift is the Christmas night's cloak, said Annie. Yeah, I guess it's supposed to help us somehow, said Jack. He unbuttoned the cloak from around his neck, then he held it out to get a good look at it. Maybe it can make us invisible, said Annie. That's nuts, said Jack. Seriously, she said, cloaks sometimes do that in stories. Well, it didn't make me invisible, did it, said Jack. Maybe you were wearing it wrong, said Annie. Give it to me. Oh, brother, said Jack, but he handed the cloak to Annie and flapped in the wind as she pulled it around her shoulders. Can you see me, she said. Yes, Annie, said Jack, rolling his eyes. I can see you. Jack looked back at the gate. Even if we get past the guards, what then, he wondered. The other world swallowed up Camelot's best knights. King Arthur said it was filled with magic and monsters. Jack, look at me now. Jack turned to Annie. She wasn't there. Where are you, he said, staring in the darkness. Cool, it works. Where are you, Jack said again, turning round. Here. Jack felt a hand touch his face. Ah, he said, jumping back. It's me, I'm invisible. I pulled the hood over my head. That's the trick. Jack felt a chill run down his spine. Oh, man, he whispered. Watch, I'm going to take the hood off. In a flash, Annie was back. It feels creepy to be invisible, she said. Jack was speechless. The magic only happens when you wear the hood, said Annie. Good trick, huh? Uh, yeah, said Jack. He shook his head. This is just too weird. Don't worry about it being weird. It's a great way to get past the guards, said Annie. Plus, it's a way to hide in the other world. We don't know when we'll... what we'll find there, right? Yeah, all right, said Jack. Okay. Good, said Annie. Now stand beside me and don't move. Jack put away his notebook. Annie threw the velvet cloak over his shoulders and backpack. Great, it's big enough for both of us, she said. She carefully arranged the folds around them, then she pulled the huge hood over both their heads. Jack looked down. He couldn't see his body at all. 
He felt like he couldn't breathe. In a panic, he threw off the hood. I hate that, he said. He told you it's creepy, said Annie, but if we don't wear it, we won't get past the guards. Yeah, I know, and we won't have protection in the underworld, said Jack. He took a deep breath. Okay, let's do it. And he pulled the hood up again. I'll hold on to the hood so it won't blow off, she said. You just think about getting across that bridge, nothing else. But I can't see my feet, said Jack. You don't need to see your feet to walk, said Annie. Come on, do it for Morgan. Right, said Jack. He and Annie stepped onto the bridge. Whatever you do, don't look down, said Annie. As they started over the bridge, the wind whistled around them. Jack couldn't help it. He looked down. Not only was his body missing, but the fog beneath the bridge was moving in a wild spinning swirl. Jack felt dizzy and faint. He stopped. Keep going, whispered Annie. Jack took a deep breath and looked straight ahead. Then he started walking again. He went slowly, step by step, toward the pale light beyond the bars of the gate. In the flickering torchlight, the guards looked like giants. As Jack and Annie slipped invisibly by them, Jack held his breath. How will we open the gate, he wondered. Whoosh, said Annie loudly. Jack's heart nearly stopped, and Annie lost her mind. What are you doing, he whispered. I'm the wind, Annie whispered back. Whoosh. Annie gave the gate a shove. It swung open as if pushed by the wind. Jack looked back and saw that the guards had turned in their direction. Quick, whispered Annie. She and Jack moved silently through the gateway. Whoosh, said Annie. She pushed the gate back. It shut with a clang. Through the bars, Jack saw the guards face the bridge again. Good work, he said to America. Good work, he said to Annie. Thanks, she said. Jack and Annie then turned away from the gate. Oh, whispered Annie. The other world, whispered Jack. Chapter 8, The Other World. The other world was completely different from the dark, cold world Jack and Annie had just left behind. They were standing at the edge of a pale green meadow. The meadow was bathed in warm, rosy sunlight. Three horses, one black, one brown, one gray, were grazing nearby. On a hillside beyond the meadow, red and purple flowers sparkled like bright buttons. It's so nice here, said Annie. Yeah, said Jack, maybe we won't need this anymore. He pulled the hood off the cloak, off their heads. He was relieved to see Annie's face and to see himself. What was the first rhyme again? asked Annie. Jack took out his notebook. He found the first rhyme and read aloud, Beyond the Iron Gate, the Keepers of the Cauldron Wait. He looked around warily. I wonder where the Keepers of the Cauldron are, he said. What do you mean? asked Annie. We just sneaked past them, remember? Whoosh! I don't know, said Jack. The rhyme says beyond the iron gate. Those guards were standing in front of the gate. They weren't beyond it. Shh, said Annie, listen. From over the hill came the faint sounds of sweet, joyful music. Maybe the keepers of the cauldron are playing that music, said Annie. Maybe, said Jack. He listened for a moment and smiled. The music made him feel light and happy. Let's go meet the keppers, said Annie. Not so fast, said Jack. Shouldn't we be invisible again, just in case? I guess so, said Annie, sighing. Jack pulled the hood of the cloak over their heads. Together they started walking invisibly across the soft meadow. They passed the three horses and climbed the flower-covered hill. At the top they looked down. Oh, man, said Jack. The hill sloped gently down into a misty green glade. In the middle of the glade, a band of musicians played flutes and pipes, drums and violins. Around the band, hundreds of dancers danced in a huge circle. The keepers of the cauldron, said Annie. The dancers and musicians were smiling and laughing. They wore blue coats and green coats, white gowns and yellow gowns. They were sparkling red slippers and hats with colored feathers. The dancers looked like people, except they all had glittering gold skin and wings that shimmered in the mist like spun silver. They're beautiful, said Annie. Yeah, they are, said Jack. I don't think we need to be invisible with them, said Annie. I think you're right, said Jack. He and Annie threw off the red cloak. They left it in the dewy grass and ran down the hillside to the winged dancers. The dancers paid no attention to them. They just kept going around and around in their joyous circle. I feel like dancing with them, said Annie. Me too, said Jack. It was strange. He was usually shy about dancing, but he wanted to join this dance more than anything. Jack pulled off his backpack 
As he set it down, he saw three swords lying in the grass, but he didn't stop to wonder about them. The music was calling. The winged dancers broke their circle and welcomed Jack and Annie into their dance. Annie held Jack's right hand as he grasped the slender golden hand of the dancer on his left. The dancer smiled down at him, but she didn't have any lines or wrinkles on her face. All the dancers looked very young, yet they seemed ancient at the same time. As Jack danced around in the circle, his heart leapt, his spirits soared, his glasses fell off, but he didn't care. He kept dancing. As he danced, everything in his mind became a blur. He forgot about Morgan and Camelot. He forgot about the quest for the water of memory and imagination. He forgot all his fears and worries. Jack, look, Annie cried. Jack looked at her. Hi, he shouted, laughing. No, don't look at me, she called. Look there, look across the circle. I can't see, he said. Three nights, Annie shouted, three nights dancing. Great, Jack shouted. No, Jack, they look awful. They look sick, Annie yelled. She pulled away from the circle and tumbled back into the grass. Jack, she called, stop dancing. But Jack didn't want to stop. He wanted to dance to the wild music forever, forever and ever and ever. Chapter 9, The Lost Nights. Annie chased Jack around the circle. Stop, Jack, she cried, stop. She grabbed his shirt and tried to pull him out of the dance. Let go, Annie, he said, leave me alone. But Annie wouldn't let go. Finally, she pulled so hard, Jack broke hands with the dancers and tumbled backward onto the grass. The wing dancers didn't seem to notice. They closed their circle and kept going around and around. Why did you do that, said Jack, sitting up. I was having fun. Look at the night, said Annie. See them? Jack still couldn't see. The world was spinning before his eyes. He ached to get back into the dance. Here, I found your glasses, said Annie. Put them on. Jack put on his glasses. He peered at the circle of dancers. He caught sight of armor glinting in the sunlight. He saw three knights dancing in a row. Two of them looked very young. The third looked much older. As they came closer, Jack saw their faces. All the joy of the music drained out of him. The knights looked tired and sick. Their hair and beards were long and scraggly. Their faces were bony and pale. Their eyes stared wildly, and their lips were frozen in ghostly smiles. What's wrong with them? asked Jack. They can't stop dancing, said Annie. They're dancing themselves to death. They must be the lost knights from Camelot, said Jack. We have to save them, said Annie. Yeah, said Jack. He tried to clear his mind and think. What about this? We get back in the dance, and we take places between the dancers and the knights. Yes, then we can pull the knights out of the circle, said Annie. Wait, said Jack. What if I can't stop dancing again? Just don't let yourself get caught by the music, said Annie. You have to think about something else. Think about why we're here. Think about Morgan. Okay, said Jack. I'll try. Jack and Annie crouched in the grass. They watched and waited as the knights danced closer and closer and closer. Now, shouted Annie. Jack and Annie rushed forward. They broke into the circle on either side of the knights. As Jack started dancing, his feet seemed to fly to the beat of the drum. He felt a wave of great joy. His worries left him. Now, Jack, cried Annie, pull away. But Jack didn't want to pull away. The music rang in his ears. Nothing mattered except the dancing. Jack, pull away now, Annie shouted again. Jack shook his head, trying to shake off Annie's voice. Morgan, Morgan, Annie yelled. The word Morgan made Jack stumble a bit in the dance. Morgan, Morgan, Annie shouted. Jack stumbled again. Then he used all his might to stop himself from dancing. He let go of the hand of the dancer on his right and threw himself out of the dance, pulling the knight on his left with him. Annie and the other two knights tumbled back with them onto the grass. Just as before, the dancers didn't seem to notice. They closed their circle and kept going round and round in their joyous, timeless dance. Chapter 10, The Knight's Gifts The three knights lay in the grass, fighting for breath. The dance, we must stop, stop dancing, gasped the older knight. You have stopped, we pulled you away, said Annie. The knight looked up at her and Jack. He had a rough, craggy face. Who are you? he asked in a hoarse voice. 
friends, said Annie. She spoke loudly to be heard over the music. We come from King Arthur's castle. We're on a quest, said Jack, to get to the water of memory and imagination. To save Camelot, said Annie. Camelot, whispered the knife. We come from Camelot. I don't recognize you. We're just visiting, said Annie, but we know all about you. You're Sir Lancelot, aren't you? Yes, breathed the knight. And Sir Percival and Sir Galahad, said Jack. Yes, my son Galahad, said the knight. King Arthur thinks you are lost forever, said Annie. Sir Lancelot closed his eyes. The dance, he said, it made us forget. I know, said Jack, the dancers must be the keepers of the cauldron. You can't get past them without getting caught up in their dance. Father, we must find the water. Sir Galahad tried to sit up, but he was too weary. He lay back in the grass. That's okay, we're here now, said Annie. You should all rest. Sir Galahad closed his eyes. Yeah, don't worry, said Jack. Annie and I will find the magic water for Camelot. But you, you are just children, said Sir Percival the third night. You must wait for us. There's no time to wait, said Jack. Camelot is dying, said Annie. We have to hurry. Then you must take this, said Sir Galahad. He reached into a leather pouch that hung around his shoulder. He took out a silver cup. With a trembling hand, the young knight gave the cup to Annie. A cup, she said. Take this too, said Sir Percival. He pulled a small wooden box from a bag that hung from his belt. He handed it to Jack. Jack opened the lid. In the middle of the box was a pointer with markings all over it. A compass, said Jack. And this, said Sir Lancelot. He took a silk cord from around his neck. A glass key hung from the cord. A key, whispered Annie. Lancelot handed the key to Annie. She and Jack looked at it closely. Then Annie hung it around her neck. When she turned back, all the knights were fast asleep. Sweet dreams, Annie said gently. You guys need a long nap. Jack and Annie stood up. I think we have all our gifts now, Jack said, but I better make sure. He hurried to get his backpack. It was lying in the grass near the knight's swords. He pulled out his notebook and read the second rhyme. Four gifts you will need, the first from me, then a cup, a compass, and finally a key. Great, said Annie. We got the cloak from the Christmas night and the other three gifts from them. This quest is really easy. Jack shook his head. It's not over yet, he said. We still have to find the cauldron with the water of memory and imagination. We'll find it, said Annie. Read the third rhyme. Jack looked in his notebook and read the third rhyme aloud. If you survive to complete your quest, the secret door lies to the west. No problem, said Annie. We survived the guards and the dance. Now the compass can show us how to go west, and the key will unlock the secret door and will fill the cup with water from the cauldron. See, it's all easy. Jack still felt worried. A little too easy, he thought. What are we waiting for, said Annie. Let's go. Jack looked down at the compass. Okay, he said. The pointer's pointing north, so west must be that way. He pointed left toward a thicket of bushes and small trees. Great, said Annie. Here, carry the cup in your pack. Jack put his notebook and the silver cup into his pack. Then he and Annie started into the thicket. They ducked under branches and pushed past bushes. Thorns scraped their hands. Twigs snapped against their faces. Jack kept checking the compass. Could they really be searching in the right place, he wondered. What kind of door would they find in a tangled thicket? Listen, said Annie, it's so quiet now. The thicket had grown eerily silent. No birds called from the bushes. No music could be heard in the distance. Jack checked the compass once more. It says we're still going west, he said. I just hope this thing works. It works, Annie said softly. Look, Annie was holding back a leafy branch. She pointed to a rocky hillside beyond the thicket. Halfway up this hillside was a ledge. Between two giant boulders on the ledge was a shining glass door. <laughs>